So welcome everyone. Shalom Aleichem. Good to Shalom see you Aleichem. all. We're going to continue uh, from last week and talk about Moses, the Invisible Man. <laughs> you remember the uh, movie and the book by H.G. Wells? Yes. So sure. uh, I published uh, an article this week about this whole issue with uh, Moses. And um, I suggested that title. Um, but they said, that's over-dramatization. So here's the title they chose. <laughs> Moses' name is erased from Tetzave. So I'll put the link at the end of class. You can go back and, and read all my arguments. And I covered a lot of more many sources that we won't cover today. So you can go in and read the, uh, the article if you'd like. Um, and actually, that's a good point. We're going to talk about that later, over-dramatization. I think that can explain... What happened with a with an error that crept into the the best scholars and some of the most revered scholars that we have today? Uh, could part of it could be over dramatization? All right, so let's uh, let's start from where we picked uh, from where we ended last time. So we were talking about the fact that Moses' name is not in Tisave, that it's really a part of a larger divine revelation talking about the tabernacle which was divided into two portions. So maybe there's no nothing to explain here. It just happens that because it's just God talking to Moses and, and uh, talking about all tabernacle-related things, that it happens to be that in this, in this uh, parsha, his, his name is not there. But uh, the commentaries, they offered homiletical interpretations. Right, we saw that we saw that really the contents of the parsha it's all a, a continuation of parsha Teruma. build the ark, build the menorah, build the altars. Now, kindle, tell them how to kindle the menorah. Here's the priestly garments, and here's the dedication ceremony. It's all it's all the same thing. So there's no no real reason to start by the Be'er Adonai Moshe Elmo, but our commentaries. They like to focus on, oh, this is interesting. His name is not there. So the earliest, we saw the earliest commentary about um, that it was taken away from him. The priesthood was taken away from him so as not to rub it in. The portion that talks about the priestly garments and all the great things that the priest is doing, so we're not going to mention Moses. So there's a Musar lesson here. If you know that somebody really wanted a position or wanted a job, or get into a program, and he didn't get it, don't be like God. Don't rub it in. Be compassionate. You know, talk about other things. Don't bring it up. Don't make him, don't put him back into the misery. Uh, nice idea for us to, to copy. Uh, whether it's Pshat, I don't think it's Pshat. Okay. Then we saw the Vilna Gaon, the seventh of Adar, and now we get to the main, the crux of the matter, which is, Moses asked for it by saying to God in the aftermath of the golden calf sin, then good. So this is a key phrase. When uh, Moses hears that God is going to destroy the entire people and start a new dynasty with Moses, he says, he pleads with God, or he, he issues an ultimatum. Now, if you will forgive their sin, well and good. But if not, erase me from the book which you have written. Ah, so this is already now getting us close to the idea of his name being erased. But wait a minute. God did forgive them. In other words, there's a condition here. If you don't forgive them, then you should erase me. But God did forgive them. So why should his name be erased? So in the commentary of the Rosh, the Rabbeinu Asher, Ben Yechiel, it's attributed to him. We'll see in a second why that matters. His nickname was Rosh, acronym of Rabbeinu Asher. He says the following. We have a volunteer to read the Rosh? Okay, so I'll read. You will find, do you, do you see the slide? You will find that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you will find that in all the weekly portions in Torah, from the birth of Moses until Deuteronomy, that he, Moses, is mentioned, except for this portion, Tetzave, and this is puzzling. And the rush continues. And I heard from Rabbi Dan Ashkenazi 
that this is because Moses said something bad before God when asking for forgiveness from the uh, from uh, for the golden calf. But if not, erase me from the book which you have written. We just saw that verse. And the rabbi said in Brachot, the curse of a righteous person, even when it's only conditioned on some other occurrence that doesn't take place, comes true. So it doesn't matter that God eventually forgave them because this is they view this as a curse, this, this verse here. Wait, where is it? I just had it in Hebrew. Where is it? There. This verse, it's as soon as he uttered these words, this is what he calls the bad thing that Moses said, you know, deleting his name, erase me. Then there, those words have power and he forces the hand of fate, so to speak. Now his name must be for, uh, deleted. Whether or not that condition happened or not, whether or not it happened, in, in terms of logic, he should not be erased because it was only conditioned upon God destroying the entire people. In the sense, look, I don't want to have anything to do with this whole Israel business if you're going to go on this, this uh, killing spree and kill all of them. But the rabbis say there's a principle here that when a righteous person utters words, even if from a logic perspective, they were only conditioned, that doesn't matter. They still have power. They still have force. So now... He forces God's hand, so to speak. Now God has to erase him. So where is he going to erase him from? He's going to erase him from the, the portion that he just wrote, which is the Tavit. And for this reason, Moses' name does not appear in this portion. So when we ask, last time we asked, why the Tzavah out of all the Parshas in the Torah? Pick, pick another Parsha. Pick a Parsha going forward. So it's like, it's imagining God writing the parshas. You know, of course, this is an anachronism. The whole division of parshas happened centuries later, but it's an anachronism. And it's like, let's imagine God, God writing the parshas. And so when Moses told him, erase me, well, God, God can't erase him from something that's not written yet. So God goes back to the latest thing he wrote, which is Tetzave, and takes his name out. So according to this interpretation, yeah, Moses' name was probably there in the first place. And then Moses said this ultimatum, and then Moses' name was taken out. So this whole drama here that his name was there, and then it was it was actually deleted. It's, it's not that it's missing; it, it was there, but it was deleted. Interesting idea. But other commentaries they wanted a more specific reason why Tetzave, and they uh, looked at Gematria. So if we look at this verse. And I highlighted the word Asher. This is a Rabbi Eliyahu Teomim Rabinovitz, the Azeret, the early 20th century. And he came up with this idea. So I'm going to try to have you come up with the same idea. Again, the Hebrew means, if not, im ayin, if you don't um, listen to me and you and you destroy all them, mecheni na misifrecha, erase me from your book, Asher Katavta, which you wrote. How could this word asher reference Tetzave? What What do you think? I'm silent because I wrote that to you already. <clears throat> okay, so I think you wrote the other thing. You you wrote the next one, but this word asher, it oh. just happens to be. Oh. Okay, oh. let's read what the Aderet says. A hint to this yeah. is. Erase me from your book, which, Asher, you have written. Asher in numerology, if you add the Aleph is one, the Sheen is 300, and the Eresh is 200, that comes to 501. Turns out, it's the same as Tetzave, which is, oh, I don't have the Hebrew word here, but it's Taf, 400, Tzadik is 90, Vav is 6, and He is 5. Guess what? 501. So you can read it. If not... Delete me from the book, Tetzave, you wrote. See that? This word Asher in Gematria is Tetzave. Okay. So that's one Gematria. And then, Charlie, you wrote this one. So we call it Gematria 2.0. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. So, Charlie, you, you explain this one. 
Okay. Well, I have to say it was from some source. I can't find the source now. So it's not my innovation and it's not my acumen. But um, so from the same verse, <clears throat> the key word there we're looking at now, misifracha, please arrange, please erase me, misifracha, which can be chopped up into misefer and take the last syllable, split off the kaf from sefer kaf. And as we know, as we're doing now with gematria, the kaf, uh, it has a value also, it's 20. So we erase me from misefer kaf, from book number 20. But book, not the same as books in our day and age, so we could say installment or parsha. Well, what's parsha number 20? There are 12 in Genesis and Titzavez, the eighth in uh, Exodus. So erase me from parsha number 20 in the Torah. Excellent. So you are uh, saying what the, the Divrei Tzadikim, you are a right uh, Dov Barish Frumer. Uh, I, I didn't. I, I read somebody else who quoted him. I didn't read it inside him. So thank you for that <laughs> explanation. It's uh, comprised of the suffix sefer and cha, and cha is twenty, and uh, so it's partial number twenty or installment, like you say, number twenty. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of a veiled reference to the book from which he needs to be uh, deleted. So these two are these are two nice gematria, but now let's talk about how unique is it. So the rush said that it's the only parsha. Let's go back to the rush. It's the only parsha from the birth of Moses until Deuteronomy, and that is a correct statement. So in in Exodus and in Leviticus and in Numbers, this is the only weekly portion where his name is not mentioned. But now we go to his son. His son, uh, this is his picture in Wikipedia, his name was Rabbi Jacob, uh, the son of, of Asher, or he has a nickname, the Tur, or Baal Haturim. Why is that his nickname? He wrote a very important halachic treatise a four-volume compendium called the Arba'at Turim, the four rows. And they are like a halachic code that deals with all the halachas possible, but divided into four sections, if you will. And each section deals with an overall subject. So one, the first section, Orachaim. That's the basis of the Shulchan Aruch, by the way. His division, his four rows, his four Turim, I are the basis for the Shulchan Aruch. Then came the Shulchan Aruch and wrote his codex, but based on the same division. Now, what is that a reference to? Turim, who had four rows? It's actually in the Parsha, in this Parsha that we're talking about, Tetzave. Yeah, the Kohen Gadol on the breastplate. Right, the Kohen Gadol. On the breastplate, he had four rows. Now, is um, Aaron here? Aaron, are you here? No. Uh, in modern Hebrew, uh, tour became the word for column. Yes, T yes, yes, a column or yes, mm -hmm. yes. But uh, probably, if you if you look at uh, Google Pictures, how was the breastplate divided? There's twelve stones. Well, you can do it in two ways. You can do four rows of three, or three rows of four columns. With I mean, four columns of three each. Right? Think of that. Just imagine it in your mind. So I said, okay, uh, of course you can read commentaries, how they understood it, but uh, we can look at uh, Google and see clearly how Google Images imagines this breastplate. So let's look at it together. And we see, what do we see? Is it four rows or four columns? Right, you, you see it. Rows. It's more four rows and three columns. Yeah. Right, right. It's all of them. I see here four rows, four mm -hmm. rows, four rows. Um, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who 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 did it four columns of three rows. I mean, you know. So clearly, again, four columns, 
Wikimedia. Yeah. Okay, so because that's the word that the Torah uses. There are arbaat turim in his in his breastplate. Let's be clear about that. The word the Torah uses the word tour and gives the number four. So I think it's in terms of biblical Hebrew, the tour meant a row, but then in modern Hebrew, they, the it, it evolved yeah. and it came yeah. to mean a column, and we have a different word for row, which is shura. Shura. Right? Okay. So that's that's the that's where he took his name from. Baal Haturin, the 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 possessor of four rows. Okay, so let's go back. Ah, let's see a video. Let's see a video about... Uh, it's also a name of a light rail station in Jerusalem. It's fascinating. They actually... <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's watch that a little bit. because it, 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 And he's going to mention the Baal HaTurim. So this is Ami, and I'm going to translate him. We have a light rail station in Jerusalem. You can see in the background even the name, HaTurim. Okay. I'm standing in one of the stations of the light rail. The Turim station. Okay, so this Tachana, this station, is named after the book uh, The Four Rows, the, four, the Arba'a Turim, that, that great halachic treatise written, written by Rabbi Jacob. He wrote this book a couple hundred years ago. And this book is the basis for the Shulchan Aruch. And these are all books of Halakha. Why did he name the book The Four Rows, The Four Turim? So then he gives the what we just talked about, this picture in the in the breastplate of the high priest. There were four turim, four rows of precious stones. Well, that's the basis for the book, the four Turim, and uh, also this station, this light rail station called Haturim. Okay, so, but now let's see what he said. What, what did the Baal Haturim, what did he say about the uh, Moses name not not appearing in in Tzabe. So here's what he said. And we have a, a volunteer to read this. It's a key a key quote. Anybody want to read it? Moses was not mentioned in this sedra. What is not found in the entire Chumash since the time Moses was born. There is no sedra that he's not mentioned. But the entire Hamash, wait a minute, something's going on here. Yeah, wait a minute, his father... What happened with Devorim, Devorim. Oh, right, in yeah. Devorim, yeah. yes. Well, this is well, just maybe... simply not, not, not true. This is factually wrong. So what happened? His father, didn't he consult with his father? <laughs> <laughs> right, we, we just saw in a commentary attributed to his father that... It's until Deuteronomy. Devarim, right. Until, until Devarim. And then somehow, so this is attributed, right? So maybe it's, this is not even written by his father. Maybe it was written by somebody else. That could be. So that could explain this whole thing. But if it's true that it's written by his father, then it's bewildering, it's puzzling, because it's a total exaggeration. The It's not the only parsha since Moses was born that, uh, that his name is not mentioned. Let me show you where he also is not mentioned. He is not mentioned in uh, in Ekev, Re'esh, Oftim, Kitetzen, Yitzavim. It's not even just one parsha. There's five parshas in Devarim where, now I grew up and I also heard this myth. And uh, when I was teaching in Hebrew school, one day I was like, this doesn't sound right. You know, I was reading Torah for a few years and I was like, this doesn't sound right. Let me go, let me have a, 
Let me do an exercise with the kids. I gave each group of kids a parsha. I said, you guys, I want you to see if Moses' name is mentioned or not. That's how we spent the whole the whole afternoon in, in Hebrew school. And we came up with these five parshas. And then I also double checked it with with uh, you know with Google and with uh, databases. But the, the 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 thing that sparked it was teaching in Hebrew school and just just feeling that something's wrong because we know that in Devarim Moses is the one talking most of the time, right? So there's some parshas that he is mentioned. There's actually he goes Vayelech Moshe needs Bar Mitzvah parsha, right? Vayelech Moshe. Okay, that's his name right there. And Moses went. Okay, Vezot uh, the last one Asher Barach Moshe Moses blessed. The people of Israel before he died, but, right? But you know that most of it, and so so with the kids, and then I said to them, look, you see, even great rabbis make mistakes. So it's always good to fact check things. But it's really bewildering because, because if it's true that his father said the argument correctly, why would he go and, and exaggerate something and write it incorrectly, especially when he was considered to be an expert on word occurrences? You have to understand, his commentary, the tour, commentary on the Torah, and aside from being a halachic expert, he was an expert in word occurrences. That's what most of his commentary does. He takes a word and he says, the word Esav appears in five different places. The word Baruch appears in 25 different places. And here's an idea that we can derive from it. And the gematria of this word is, so the his claim to fame was he knows where word occur in the Torah and Tanakh. And here he makes this very basic error doesn't something's wrong so uh he misled many many of, of our not many but a few of the great scholars of today uh he misled lord rabbi jonathan sakzal so don't take my word for it i want i want to see it inside uh let's what what he said about this about this uh Lack in missing Moses, the invisible Moses. So he said, uh, here, I'll, I'll show you the uh, inside. So this is from his, uh, uh, he passed away a few years ago. Very prolific writer, uh, very insightful. Uh, so, so Parsha Tetzave, do you see Rabbi Sachs's prophet and priest? <laughs> yeah, you guys see it, right? The Sedra of Tetzave, as commentators have noted, has one unusual feature. It is the only Sedra from the beginning of Shemot to the end of Devarim that does not contain the name of Moses. Several interpretations have been offered. And then he goes through the ones that we saw. So, he didn't fact check Balaturim, and he made a mistake here because you know he saw it written somewhere in, in Balaturim, and again Balaturim was considered an expert, so you know he wouldn't he wouldn't copy just some some anybody who wrote that. But Balaturim, you know, and it's printed. Ah, another thing, his commentary was printed in all the rabbinic editions of the Torah, Mikraot Gedolot, the ones that they gave out in synagogues. Versus his father's, which is very esoteric. You have to go online and find it. So imagine, every week, you 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 read, you open your Chumash, and you see the Balaturim. This is the only part in the last four books of the Torah where Moses is not mentioned. Every year you see that. Your mind starts to get used to it, and you don't question things. And so, a great rabbi like him, very, very insightful and prolific writer, and he has, and, and again, uh, he could have just uh, corrected it by saying, it's the only sedra from the beginning of Shemot until the beginning of Devarim. If you just changed one word here, then it would be a correct statement, right? And so, and it's a, it's a minor thing, but uh, not only he made that mistake. So let's see a few more uh, people who made that mistake. What, what, what do you mean? Wh which parshas are up to the beginning of Devarim? All the parshas from the from the birth of Moses until the end of Chumash Bamidbar, this is the only parsha that he's not mentioned. But Rabbi Sachs claimed that this are, this is true for all the parshas from the beginning of Shemot until the end of Devarim, and we just saw that's not true. We we saw that there's five parshas in Devarim where Moses' name is not mentioned. 
Very easy to check it. Very easy. I mean, it takes five minutes, 10 minutes. I did it with my, my Sunday school kids. Uh, and then, and then, so how would Rabbi Sachs, and again, what, what about the editors of Rabbi Sachs? Couldn't they check this? Right? It just shows you there's a, a mindset that is sometimes, I would say, even pervasive in the rabbinic world that you trust what's written by Gedoylin, by, by great rabbis. Yeah. And, and even though it's not a major point, in other words, everything else that Rabbi Sachs wrote in that column could be said, could be uh, an inter interesting interpretation, but you just have to say it correctly. You say that Moses' name is not mentioned in the Tzave, and it's unique because in the three books of Shmot, Vayikra, and Bamidbar, that's the only one. Well, keep in mind, Rabbi Sachs had a lot of students uh, sitting in the back of the base midrash, putting, doing his research. I don't say that flippantly. He did. I mean, he was very prolific, and he had a lot of people who were contributing to these these things that he wrote. So it may have been a mistake inside of a mistake. Okay, interesting. Uh, possible, definitely. Uh, even my great aunt, uh, her classes were fascinating. And, uh, you know, to this day, we read, and so many people, thousands of people enjoy her books. Even she, uh, this this um, mistake crept into her book. Let's read it together. But one feature is unusual. It is unique that it's the only parsha in the four books of the Torah, Shemot until Devarim, in which Moses' name is not mentioned even once, and our commentators have noted this. Now, I thought maybe the English translator made this mistake. So I went and looked at the Hebrew. It's in the Hebrew, actually. So the mistake is, was written by her. You know, it's, it's. I can't blame the, the translator, Arya Newman, I think his name. Uh, again, she saw it and she grew up with this Balaturim. Imagine it, it's printed in your Chumash. It's it's like our red Chumash, right? It's like, it's Chaim. And every, every year you see that and you get used to the idea and you don't even... Think, why should I fact check it? Balatur, I mean, he knows. I mean, he, he, he's probably right in many of in most of the things he said, but he's probably right with this thing. <laughs> and finally, our homish did the same mistake. Our it's time, uh also, <laughs> also fell into this trap. This parsha is the only one in the last four books of the Torah in which the name of Moses does not appear. Noting this literary curiosity, some commentators explain it. Uh, so Bill asked, what's going on here? I think the the best explanation is uh, the simplest explanation. And that is that uh, errare humanum est. That's the Latin phrase, meaning to err is human. Every human being can make errors. And if it's within our powers to check things, we should. Certain things we can't check. Certain arguments in physics, there's no way we can check it. We would need a whole laboratory. But when it's a simple argument, I think we should always check it because great people make mistakes. And uh, great rabbis make mistakes. Great professors make mistakes. Everybody can make a mistake. Now, I'm not the first one to discover it. What I found doing my research is that in the 18th century already, it was debunked. This argument of Bala Turim, his error was caught on, but there's no internet then. It's a very esoteric book called Itur Bikurim. You see, he called himself Etor. I'm a I'm a commentary on the tour. It's a play on words. Mm, cool. It's, a, it's an interesting play on words. It's it's a decoration uh, that they put on the first fruits when they brought them to the temple. So he says, I don't understand. Do you see the? Etor yes, the yes, we see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have a volunteer to read. I've been talking too much. I don't understand how Batorim wrote quote, which is not the case in all of the Chumash. That is, since the time Moses was born, there is no Sidra where he is not mentioned, end of quote. But we can see with our own eyes that also in Parsha Akeb and in Parsha Re'e and Parsha Shoftim, Moses is not mentioned. Paren, he forgot two more. Kitet <laughs> say in Nitzavim uh, SL, the, the editor. I, I asked wise people and no one had an answer for me. Da -da. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so now again, his his commentary was not printed in all the chumashes, and there was no internet. You know, you you would have to have his book uh, to access it. Now I could find it on the internet. I, I actually I found on the um, 
uh, yeah, you know, in, in a copy in the National Library of Israel. Uh, I don't have this book at home. I just I just found this on the internet. and was able to to copy it from there. Um, but in his day and age, so so oh, when did he live? 18th century, kind of 1751. Mm. Um, so we see, you know, the the limits of of scholarship scholars. He got it right. He he realized Balatour made a mistake, and he's very humble about it. He says, I I asked a few people and. And I, I, I don't know how to explain it, uh, you know, and he at the end of his comment, he says, may God shed light on this unsolved mystery. You know, <laughs> how did Bhattori make such a mistake? He even tries to say maybe he really meant the word Chumash, he meant only the book of Shemot, but he refutes it. He says, no, it's clear that the Bhattori thought that it's the only time in the entire Torah or in the entire four books, the last four books of the Torah, uh, and then he just says, look, I don't know how to explain it. Okay, so uh, may, he says, may God enlighten my eyes. He ends it that way. Um, but it was a very rare book, so nobody really knew about this Itur Bikurim. And so what happened is that even scholars to this day and age, uh, you know, repeated Bal Hatur's claim, uh, which is inaccurate. So, um, but let's uh, end with a, a quote from her book which uh, explains, it's a nice quote, uh, explaining the abscess, going back to one of the earliest explanations we saw. Do we have a volunteer to read her words? Okay. The conspicuous absence of Moses' name is taken in this commentary to indicate the extraordinary meekness and self-effacement of Israel's leader in graciously accepting the, the delegation of the priesthood to Aaron and his sons. Moses, as it were, puts himself in the background and pushes his brother forward. Thank you. So I think it's a nice drash um, about, uh, you know, letting his brother shine and taking backstage, so to speak. Um, but again, she could have, they, it wouldn't yeah. detract from this drash that she brings if she had made the accurate statement, which is the conspicuous absence is from the books of Shemot, Vayikra, and Bamidbar, right? And so there he is, that there, when you consider those books, yes, Tetzave is the only parsha, but of course, in Devarim, we do have a few parshas that uh, his name is omitted. So uh, I think we'll end here. Thank you all for Tom, I have a I have a comment. This brings me back to one of your previous uh, sessions where we talked about this might be the the origin for the separation of powers in constitutional government. Ah, yes, yes. Although that's not much of a separation when you give the priesthood to your brother. Yes, <laughs> you're right. Right. You're right. Michael Shemai, can you go back to your first slide where yeah. you let you list the topics in Tintavet? And one of them is about the Miluim. Right. The, the first slide. Yeah, it was here, here. Yeah. I just want to point out here, part three, Shiva'i Mei Miluim, that uh, when they needed a word for the uh, army reserves way mm -hmm. back, they took the word Miluim here. That's mm -hmm. that's the Israeli, now the, you see it every day in the papers that we have yeah. 300,000 300, soldiers now in the Miluim. Yeah. 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 Right. They took okay. it from the uh, inauguration of the priests. Yes. From right. From. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.